Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you to Vlad to, for introducing the, the conference this morning. Um, as Vlad said, this is the, the third iteration of Transformations, and it's a, a delight to, to actually see some faces this morning. It's been obviously a very strange year. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Naomi House, and I'm a senior lecturer in interior architecture and design. Um, it's a pleasure to chair this panel this morning. We, it's, a, it's a small panel. <laughs> um, with, with two students presenting. Unfortunately, we had one with late withdrawal, um, but we've got Lucy Brooker and Harry McCrindle here from um, graphic design and, and fashion design, I understand, who are going to be presenting their work. Uh, Lucy will be talking about the changing perception of British gardens. Um, from what I can read of her abstract, she's produced a set of designed outcomes for a scheme called Plant Power. So we're gonna see how she, how she did that and the focus on the kind of themes of politics and, and social themes such as control and power. So I'm really interested to see how that pans out. Lucy's actually, I think, prepared a, a video presentation which she's going to share with us. And then after Lucy's presented, we'll move straight into Harry's uh, presentation. Um, his project is called Climbing in the Himalayas, Ascent to the Top, how lessons from mountaineering provide pioneering business models for sustainable fashion entrepreneurs. So you can see we've got a kind of diverse couple of presentations here. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing or hearing what the, the discussion is um, post the presentations themselves. So Lucy, if you are ready, you, do you want to share from your end? Is that okay? I know you sent um, me the presentation. Yeah, so I, I shall try and share the screen. Um, uh, I guess before I play, I'll just kind of introduce myself, I guess. So I'm Lucy. Um, for the past three years, I've been studying graphic design at Middlesex University. Um, this presentation kind of already introduced it, but it's all about sort of gardening um, and gardens in Britain. And um, I kind of look at kind of the research side and then kind of more of the design side. So most of the research side I did back last year, kind of from November to December. So a lot of like the statistics I discussed uh, from sort of last year. And then the design process kind of started in February and then went on to about May. So um, just to give a little bit of background about the process I kind of went through. Um, I'll just play it now. So if it's too loud or you can't hear it, just let me know. Um, Is it just me or we can't hear? Lucy, we can't hear it. Uh, um, I, it might be something to do with your settings. Um, Vlad, have you got any ideas? I think when you, when you, if you stop sharing Lucy, your screen, and then when you click share again, there will be like a tick box somewhere uh, that says like either optimize for video or share with <clears> us. <throat> and that's what Emma was suggesting yesterday in the other conference. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, optimize screen sharing for video clips. Okay, let's try again. I'm presuming you can kind of like see what I'm seeing. Now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me know if you can hear this this time. Hi everyone, I'm Lucy, yes. I study okay, graphic great. design and for my final major project report I decided to look into how art and design challenge the perceptions of British gardens in relation to their political and social role. Firstly, I just wanted to explain briefly the three main reasons why I decided to focus on this topic. So number one was because of my own personal interest in gardening. Number two was the political relevance of gardening because of the connection between British gardens and symbols of class hierarchies and economic identities which I'm going to explain in a bit more detail in a minute. And the third reason was the current relevance gardening has in society due to the global pandemic and the raised awareness of mental health issues. Just to expand on that last point a bit, I think a lot of people are aware of the gardening boom that has occurred both in this country and all over the world because of the pandemic, and that people are now being more appreciative of the outdoor spaces than ever before, as these statistics show. 
the statistic at the bottom relates directly to gardening and the amount of money that the British public are willing to spend on their gardens, which shows how important green spaces currently are to the British public, as well as the important connection between green spaces and mental health. So in my report, I started off by firstly looking into the historical context of British gardens, which is where the connection of British gardens to political themes of control and power became more evident to me. To give some context, gardens have been ingrained in British culture for hundreds of years, with some of the oldest gardens in Britain dating from around the 17th century. Prior to this time, one of the main influences to garden design was religion. For example, gardens were a prominent feature in monasteries when its purpose was described as a place where humans and the divine could dwell together in mutual pleasure and intimate love. Some of the first historical events I started to look into were Renaissance gardens and the landscape movement, which I've grouped together here as they were both used by members of the upper classes, such as monarchs, as symbols of power and control over their subjects. They also both date from around the same times, which was the mid-17th and 18th century. Firstly, focusing on Renaissance gardens, they prominently featured aspects of both Italian and French garden design at the time. An example of this can be seen in the reconstruction of the 17th century privy garden at Hampton Court with its regimented planting and clipped yews. Every plant was cut to shape, which symbolised the control monarchs, the rich and the wealthy had over the lower and working classes through the controlled nature of their garden designs. A quote from Roy Strong's book about English Renaissance gardens explores this further and even compares the level of power these monarchs exhibited through their gardens to the likes of God in the creation story of the Bible. Moving on to look at garden designs from the landscape movement, you can see how although these two different movements shared a similar purpose, that they were visually very different to one another, with the designs of the landscape movement being characterised by large open areas that appeared to be natural but were actually arranged and ordered. These aspects can be seen in these examples designed by William Kent and Lancelot Brown. Although more subtle in appearance than the designs of Renaissance gardens, these gardens undertook extreme changes to the landscape, including reciting huge quantities of earth, damming streams into lakes and planting thousands of trees, but ultimately resulted in a grand perception. You couldn't tell where the garden ended and the surrounding countryside began, which again installed the idea of great power over the land and the people. I then went on to look into the first public park and the way both world wars affected gardening in Britain. I have again grouped these two events together as they both actually opened up gardening to more people and made it more accessible for the lower and working classes. The first public park opened in Derby around 1880. Due to the rise in industry, many people from rural areas moved from the countryside into towns and cities where there was little open or green space. In response to this, Joseph Strutt and John Claudius Loudon created an arboretum, or a collection of trees, of which his purpose was to show off, which again links to themes of power, as one would usually need to be horticulturally educated and affluent in order to experience one. This changed the perception and roles of gardens, as politically, it could be argued that the esteem and privilege of gardens in society at the time was lowered, due to the increased availability to people of the lower and working classes. Sometime after this, in the early 20th century, the association between British gardens and those of privilege was challenged due to the rise in allotments in response to both World War I and World War II. Although allotments were available to the British public prior to both world wars, the increased demand for food meant that the number of allotments doubled during the First World War to a total of 1.5 million. The Second World War added a further half a million more allotments to this number, which allowed more people to have access to their own gardening spaces. As can be seen in these three posters, campaigns challenged the role of British gardens from a space of leisure to one of great importance and necessity. It also politically changed the idea that growing vegetables was only for the working classes and encouraged all classes to grow food in all kinds of spaces. Allotments still play a key part in today's society, especially within cities where gardens are more likely to be considerably smaller, with gardens in London being 26% smaller than the national average, and the smallest of any region in Great Britain. On top of this, many Londoners may only have access to a small balcony, given that flats comprise just over half of London's accommodation. With the substantial increase in the time people are spending gardening in Britain due to the pandemic, there is now a plethora of gardening websites that can be accessed online by anyone of any social status. I have also found examples of gardening gadgets such as Plantone, a small electronic device that creates an indoor microclimate for plants. These examples make knowledge about growing plants easy to access and allows more people from all backgrounds to grow plants under limiting circumstances. 
After this historical research into the designs of British gardens, I then went on to look at some more modern designers and the way their art and also their own garden designs challenged people's perceptions of British gardens and their roles. The designers I decided to focus on were Mark Quinn, Keith Arnatt and Derek Jarman. So firstly looking at Mark Quinn's exhibition piece called Garden. It was made in the year 2000 and featured real flowers and plants preserved in silicon within an acrylic tank, which is kept frozen at minus 20 degrees Celsius. Visually, this piece is quite jarring because of the combination of natural materials like the beautiful foliage with industrial and man-made materials like glass and steel. Quinn previously explained how he wanted this piece to focus on manipulation and how gardens nowadays are constructed and not grown through processes like landscape manipulation and genetic flower modification. It was concluded that this piece challenged perceptions of nature and the natural world in relation to British gardens through both the man-made presentation and manipulation of the piece, which implies in Quinn's own words that there is no such thing as nature anymore and that British gardens are political symbols of these previously mentioned issues. I then went on to look into the work of the British artist and photographer Keith Arnett. So to have taken a more reticent approach on this series than his previous two, the gardeners show different people standing outside in their gardens and was described by the photographer Ian Walker as portraits in landscape. As you can see, the photos themselves are full of character and show how the personalities of the individuals translate into their gardens, which suggests an intimate connection between the gardeners and their land. The gardeners' personalities are portrayed to the viewer through themselves, their clothing, position and facial expression. I took Fabian's theory of leisure class into account and deciphered that messages around the gardener's class and social status were portrayed to the viewer through particular elements of their garden's design. For example, when comparing these two photos, the man in the right image appears to have a much bigger garden and seems to have spent more time and money on mowing the lawn and cutting his hedges to shape than the woman in the photo on the left, which also links back to historical ideas around controlling nature to express power. From this, it can be understood that someone's personality and economic class can be reflected in their garden, which can overall impact its social and political role. Finally, I explored the garden design of the revolutionary filmmaker and painter Derek Jarman, who acquired Prospect Cottage located on the coast in Dungeness in 1986. As can be seen from the images of his house and its garden, it's quite unusual, being located in the middle of a stony beach near a power station. The location itself may be considered to be going against the more traditional political and social roles for a British garden, especially one owned by a wealthy and famous former filmmaker. In an interview with Jarman's gardener, Johnny Bruce, he describes Dungeness as a surreal place, which he believed attracted Jarman and was a location suited to an artist like him. In another interview with the botanist and gay activist Dr. Mark Spencer, he makes the connection between the structure of the garden and Jarman's queer identity. The ideas he expresses tie strongly to theories around LGBTQ safe spaces where people from the community can go to freely express their identity. This supports the traditional idea that British gardens can act as a sanctuary, which again links back to themes on mental health, but pushes against normal social roles of what a garden can be, both through its physical appearance and through its uses and symbols as an LGBTQ safe space. Lastly, I just wanted to mention a few key quotes from an interview with the punk icon Jordan Mooney, who Derek Jarman had previously worked with. The first quote implies that there were no physical, political or social barriers in Jarman's garden and that it was a place to challenge structures of power and control. Mooney also saw the garden as a view into the world of Derek because he didn't think in a linear way. Both these statements, as well as the additional statements I have shown from other interviews, show the fascinating role Derek Jarman's garden had of reflecting who he was. In his life, he naturally challenged traditional politics and social roles through his personal life and his art, as well as clearly communicating these ideas through the design of his garden. After this research around British gardens and their political and social roles, I began to think about the design process for my final major project. I was still unsure about what my exact focus should be for this project, but interviews I conducted with Alice Vincent, a well-known garden writer, author and gardener, and Ellen Miles, an online guerrilla gardening activist, pushed me to focus on encouraging people to garden through empowerment. 
These are two quotes from the interviews that stood out to me, especially Ellen Miles' quote, everyone should be able to grow things, which ultimately led me to create designs for my own made-up UK-based scheme called Plant Power, which had the aim to empower the public to garden, no matter their space restrictions or skill level. My initial visual inspiration came from homemade protest signs, which I liked as they had personal touch to them, yet were powerful and stood for the individual's beliefs. I was also inspired by the messages on the signs, as they had to be short, sharp and to the point in order to be successfully communicated. I implemented these techniques into my first set of posters, as can be seen from the example image on the right. It was also recommended to me to look into Chinese propaganda posters from the Cultural Revolution period, which began in the 1960s, in order to develop the visual language of my designs. Although these posters have no direct link to gardens or gardening, they do link to political themes of control and power, and feature powerful visuals like the red sun rays, which are used to direct the viewer's focus. When comparing these Chinese propaganda posters to my designs, it is clear to see the visual influence they had on my outcomes. In the end, my final outcomes for this project consisted of designs for billboards, posters, seed packets, signs, a social media page, and a starter pack. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you very much, Lucy. That was, that was great. Absolutely stuffed full of ideas and things to discuss later. <laughs> well done. Thanks. Um, Thank you. So we're going to move straight into yours, Harry, if that's okay. And then... Um, Vlad has just reminded everybody to post questions in the chat as you as you think of them and we'll come back to the discussion about Lucy's work as well as Harry's after Harry's finished his presentation. So Harry as soon as you're ready. Yes, okay I'll share my screen. Okay. Uh, so hi, my name's Harry, um, and so I'm presenting to you a PowerPoint about my dissertation, Climbing in the Himalayas, uh, How Lessons Learned from Mountaineering Provide Pioneering Business Models for Sustainable Fashion Entrepreneurs. Um, so I chose to study this particular topic following my interest in exploration and mountain climbing uh, within my design project. I also have an interest in geography and sustainability within the fashion industry. Uh, so in this presentation, I will explore how mountaineering, climate change and the pressures that the Himalayas face can help to provide pioneering business models for sustainable fashion entrepreneurs. Um, so I chose to study the Himalayas as they're seen as the ultimate challenge in competitive climbing and exploration worldwide, with roughly 800 people ascending Everest every year. However, the romance and challenge of the mountaineering in the Himalayas has arguably been overshadowed by some big sustainability issues caused by the increase in tourism and mountaineering in the region and coupled with general pressures from worldwide climate change and global warming. Um, mountaineering sportswear brands and the fashion industry in general play a huge role in controlling the extent at which global warming mountaineering and climate change impact the himalayas for example the fashion industry is responsible for 10 percent of annual global carbon emissions which is more than all international flights and maritime shipping combined and greenhouse gas emissions could rise up to and beyond 50 percent by 2030. Understanding how such mountaineering fashion brands are influenced by such issues in their approaches and how successful they are in terms of sustainability may provide valuable lessons for fashion entrepreneurs and the fashion industry more generally. So my research involved examining the gear used to ascend the Himalayas, the processes involved in the production of this gear and the evolution it has gone through since the first recorded ascent of Everest. In the final section of my dissertation, I drew on several theorists comparing their opinions on consumption and sustainability. After assessing their opinions, I focused on the sustainability of the mountaineering brand, the North Face. I concluded by considering whether the response of North Face is enough to help reduce the strain on the Himalayas and whether there are lessons learned, uh, to be drawn from this for fashion entrepreneurs. 
Uh, so the Himalayas are a, it's a huge culturally diverse mountain range with all sorts of different people and cultures spread out over the five countries it occupies. Uh, the Himalaya mountain range is located mostly in Bhutan, India and Nepal, though China and Pakistan also occupy some of it. All of them have similar structured economies in these regions, with tourism being the main source of employment and trekking mountaineering based tourism uh, constituting 20 to 25 percent of total tourism in Nepal. The large increase in tourism has brought much needed income to the region, but has also created significant environmental problems. Everest in particular has a huge litter problem. Mountaineers leave a whole range of rubbish and gear behind, uh, so ranging from oxygen canisters to sort of tents and gear. Uh, and the National Geographic Society labelled Everest the world's highest garbage dump. Uh, so it's quite a fitting quote, quote on the slide. It says, even under the best conditions, climbing the tallest mountain in the world is exhausting, dangerous work. Sorry, I just need to move this. Dropping used supplies on the mountain rather than carrying it with them can save vital energy and weight. But the accumulated trash is still steadily ruining one of the most unique places on earth. Um, so the Himalayas also face other environmental challenges, aside from the pressures that mountaineering causes. These are mainly due to climate change. Uh, the Himalayas is the source of the eight largest rivers in Asia and is known as the water tower of Asia, with the rivers and their tributaries sustain about, sustaining about 1.4 billion people. Climate change is currently the main reason that glacier retreat in the Himalayas has increased in pace which is a huge problem for the people of the Himalayas if they, they have the largest concentration of glaciers outside the polar region and hold vast stores of fresh water. If climate change continues at the current rate, the Himalayan region will suffer huge changes in freshwater flows with jam damaging effects on the local people and biodiversity. Uh, it's also the region is also particularly vulnerable because warming in the Himalayas is three times greater than the global average. Um, and this sort of glacial melt will result in both flooding and water shortages for the area. So how do fashion and mountaineering gear contribute to this? So here's a, in the background, there's a snapshot of some of the kit that might be used on a mountaineering expedition. But a recent kit list for Everest included over 70 items, many of which will be left at different points along the climb. Um, this exemplifies the direct negative environmental impact to the Himalayan mountain region that mountaineering brands can make. But then the, the materials that mountaineering gear is made from indirectly impact the environment in the production process, uh, depending on how much they contribute to climate change and um, how damaged the, the product's use and then how it's disposed of um, are also all indicators of a textile's environmental impact. So it's just kind of uh, that it, it can indirectly impact the Himalayas through its contributions to climate change. Um, so looking at the ev evolution of climbing gear since the uh, first recorded ascent in 1920. So in the 1920s, when George Mallory and Andrew Irvine attempted their ascent of Everest, they were clad in clothing made from natural fibres such as silk, cotton, wool and gabardine. The clothing was fairly good at insulating and keeping warmth to the body and very effective when worn at high altitudes. All fabrics were natural and biodegradable over time. However, the use of cotton is a sustainability issue as it is water intensive in its production. Silk is also made from the cocoons of mulberry silkworms and to feed the silkworms, many mulberry trees must be grown using further resources and land. Wool, however, is a high performance fabric that is completely natural, biodegradable and renewable with great performative qualities and it uses less water in its harvest and production. So how has mountaineering gear advanced? By the first successful ascent of Everest in 1953, gear had changed. Nylon replaced everything that was made from silk as it helped to provide a strong wind resistant outer layer. 
However, nylon is a type of plastic derived from oil and is considerably worse for the environment than any of the fabrics previously used in the ascent of Everest. It is non-biodegradable and will sit in a landfill for hundreds of years and its production uses finite resources such as oil and coal. Nylon can be recycled, however it cannot be recycled indefinitely. So fast forward to present day, most natural fabrics are now replaced by synthetic fibers in line with the fashion industry as a whole. Synthetic fabrics account for 63% of the material input for the textiles production. Polyester, another plant plastic based fabric made with oil is now a common feature in the majority of mountaineering brands as gear. In 2015, over 330 million barrels of oil were used to make polyester. Uh, there's also sort of been big advancements in the technology for better performance. Um, so base layers, for example, are designed with the ability to quickly dry sweat so the body can better regulate its temperature. Um, and an example of this is the North Face's flash dry technology, which is a cotton with a synthetic thermal layer, which allows moisture and sweat to dry quickly and keep the wearer warm. However, again, the use of synthetics is not sustainable and the use of cotton can lead to the use of chemicals and pesticides which seep into the ground, contaminating the soil and groundwater supplies. Um, so in the final section, I kind of gathered, um, well, I, I, I drew on the theorists Todashini et al, Fletcher and Tam, and then Brooks, uh, and compiled their, different view, their differing views on sustainably, sustainability into a table to help me assess a brand's level of sustainability. Um, so I, I used the main themes of using less, less consumerist, consumer awareness and governance and corporate responsibility, which were all uh, themes that they taught, they all sort of talked about individually. Uh, Todashini et al sort of uh, was talking about sustainability from a more business perspective. Brooks was uh, very anti-consumerist and then Fletcher and Tam were kind of uh, coming from this idea of uh, putting the world first and sort of uh, relearning what our relationship is with the world as opposed to focusing on any form of um, business. Um, so I, I then used my table to assess the level of sustainability that the North Face meets and how the brand impacts the Himalayas, an area where their gear is used by most mountaineers and that they passionately cite as being a place of great importance to them embodying the ethos and branding of their company. The North Face highlights that using less is an area where they direct their main focus on striving to be sustainable, as they found that their environmental impact largely stems from product manufacturing and fabric processing. They address environmental impact by incorporating recycled material, reducing waste in their fabric mills and offering a lifetime warranty on all their products. Uh, so they also offer free repairs and any products that can't be repaired are either repurposed or downcycled. To an extent, this is good sustainability policy. However, recycled material, particularly polyester, is still harmful to the environment as always required in the production process. It's also important to note that though this is a good step towards being more sustainable, arguably this does not go far enough to avert catastrophic climate change. I then explored how the North Face encourages less consumerism, and I found that the North Face could go further in encouraging less consumption of its products beyond offering lifetime warranties. Uh, this approach was reflected in Patagonia's Do Not Buy This Jacket campaign uh, from Black Friday in 2011, which seemingly actively discouraged consumption of their goods. However, can a fashion business like the North Face run on a profit making basis, really reduce consumption to a degree that is needed. The North Face also work towards creating consumer awareness around their product. They encourage consumers to adopt a circular approach to their gear through the Close the Loop initiative, whereby the customers of the product can drop unwanted, broken or out of use clothing at one of their stores to then be repurposed, repaired or recycled into raw material. In return, customers are given vouchers towards the next purchase for donating and all proceeds go to charity. This type of sustainable initiative whereby you educate and involve consumers with ideas of being sustainable is important. 
Having consumers that care about where a product comes from or how it is made seems essential in encouraging change and widening the sustainable effort. Um, so in terms of demonstrating corporate responsibility, the North Face declare that they operate via social, environmental and ethical principles, including measures to reduce the environmental impacts of their products and the production of their products, ensuring their, walk, their workforce is treated fairly and ensuring their suppliers reflect these principles. For example, they're partnered with Blue Sign Technologies, who promote a system that helps to reduce the water and energy use of the North Face's mills. Um, they, the North Face also has a target of running only on renewable energy by 2025, and they've joined uh, several coalitions and um, sort of alliances that align their care for the environment. Certainly the North Face seems to be committed to its ethical, social and environmental responsibilities. So overall, the North Face can be seen to be both committed to and have made clear progress towards becoming more sustainable in all aspects advocated by some key theorists. Their approach offers some lessons for fashion entrepreneurs, including a focus on material selection to decrease the impact on the environment, working with suppliers to improve the use of resources, environmental impacts, and ensuring an ethical workplace, making products to last and promoting the recycling of products post-use, and partnering with other fashion brands and actors to invest in improving production processes to decrease impacts and to invest in conservation. So in conclusion, it's clear that there are lessons to be learned from mountaineering and mountaineering brands for sustainable fashion entrepreneurs. The accelerated process of global warming and the adverse effects it is having on the Himalayas are a clear example of the need for change. For example, the North Face recognizes how the region will be affected by a warming climate in the coming decades and how this will threaten the water supply for the one fifth of the world's population. This has provided mountaineering fashion brands who hold the environment as one of their inspirations with the incentive to innovate and change the way their businesses operate to decrease their impact on the environment. However, given the extent and pace of the impact of humans and the fashion industry on the world, such actions may not be enough. Fashion companies are not, a, well, this is a good quote from, I can't, I can't really pronounce the name. I think it's Le, Lehman or Lehman. Um, fashion companies are not implementing sustainable solutions fast enough to counterbalance the negative environmental and social impacts of the rapidly growing fashion industry. Um, exploring the history of mountaineering, the issues of climate change and fashion, and the way the North Face has approached sustainability has helped me to conclude that there's still much to be done if fashion is to be truly sustainable and to reduce the impact of the world and the Himalayas in particular. Thank you for listening. Harry, thank you so much for that. Again, another really fascinating presentation, very different from the first one. Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting to have these uh, these two projects um, in tandem with one another. Um, so thank you both. That was a really fascinating um, set of ideas that are coming across there. You know, in terms of Lucy's uh, presentation, there's a huge amount to discuss. I think. I mean, personally, it's the the latter part of the presentation where Lucy began to talk about kind of guerrilla gardening. And this notion of gardening as a sort of a particular kind of activist spatial practice, I think that that's really, really fascinating. And Harry, I'm, you know, this this is a, a huge problem, isn't it? The kind of the fashion industry in a way faces a, a bigger task than any other to to address, you know, climate change and its and its role uh, within that. But I'm kind of interested to to, to think about how you can kind of begin to sort of reflect back onto the, the space of the Himalayas themselves, you know, kind of really, you know, that, that notion of Everest as being this kind of huge rubbish tip is obviously an incredibly depressing um, trope. Um, but you know, how can we sort of, how can we kind of begin to relink these discourses, I think, because it's all very well to discuss all of this in terms of the sort of silos of, of disciplines, but actually this is a kind of a larger problem that is requires sort of interconnected thinking. 
not um, these kind of separate discourses, as we said. So anyway, we can we can now um, turn to questions. Um, I noticed that Emma has already posted a, a couple of comments and, and questions in the chats. Emma, I don't know if you want to kick off and actually ask these directly to, to yeah, sure. Harry. Yeah, thank you both so much, Lucy and Harry. I really, really enjoyed both of your presentations and they were wonderful to view as a pair, really, really thought provoking. Um, Lucy, I was very interested in your own experience and uh, kind of interest in gardening and just wondered if your research had kind of motivated you to experiment with the way that you use plants and gardening around your own home environment. I'd be interested to find out more about that and I kind of uh, maybe I'll take that question first to Lucy. Um, yeah sure so um, I guess kind of like before the project I was interested in gardening. Um, I kind of started like growing vegetables and things um, in 2019 so that's kind of when my interest began um, and I kind of realised through research and things that I guess um, I kind of had I guess um, I wouldn't say privilege, but I kind of already had a lot of gardening resources, like I had access to a lot of things already. And I kind of realized that a lot of people in the UK don't have access to these things. Um, so that was kind of why I turned my project to kind of look at making gardening more accessible for like either people that don't have the space to garden or don't have like the money to garden. Um, and I guess since then, like this year, I've been growing vegetables and things again. Um, I think a big thing that I didn't really look at in my project but has kind of affected me is kind of using soil and things that are sustainable which I guess kind of links to being what he was talking about like peat free soil for example mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a lot of things on tv about how um you know buying peat free is really important and necessary um and actually like a lot of plants that you buy directly from garden centers like the ones that come pre-potted are potted in like peat um soil that has peat in it mm -hmm. Um, kind of taking in more sort of like sustainability into account when I am gardening now is a big thing um, but yeah apart from that I guess it's kind of changed how I see gardening so I guess I'm more aware of like other people and how they garden compared to how I garden and thinking about it as a thing like um, obviously not everyone has the same experience so kind of taking it into account when I guess talking to others about gardening um, so yeah, that's kind of how it's affected me personally um, in this project. Thank you for your question. Well, it really struck home to me when you said like more than 50% of people in London don't have gardens. I yeah. am one of those people, I don't have a garden and I'm always thinking of ways to try to bring a little bit more greenness into my life. So I really, really enjoyed your presentation from that angle. Thank you. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you. Emma, do you want to ask Harry the question that... I don't know. Vlad has his hand up. Do you want to come in, Vlad? I can have... Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a sort of a general comment, but also uh, I've, I've got, like, specific questions as well. <laughs> so um, it's it's really great to see Harry's um, and, and Lucy's presentation, like, together, because I think that both papers, although, like, it kind of looks that, you know, like, the, the topics are different. I think that, the, like, both of them, you can look at them from the perspective of power relations. And it's really, really interesting. So for, for, for um, uh, the first presentation, I, I really uh, enjoyed and I really appreciate the fact that you looked at the history of, of um, British gardens and you, you try to look at the, you know, like how power kind of like inserts itself in, in, in for example, like different kinds of fashions in, in um, designing uh, these this gardens. and. Um, to bring it to today, there is like there is a very interesting phenomenon which is taking place now uh, because of the pandemic. So, um, for example, if you're looking at the real estate um, article in the Guardian or whatever, just like telling you how the market is exploding and there's a new bubble and so on and so forth. But it's partly explained by the fact that a lot of people from the cities, from the big cities, are moving to you know like on the on the city's outer rims or uh, maybe in the countryside because they're looking for more space and they're looking for a garden, right? And um, so I, like, I happen to have a garden and it happens that like um, the garden needs some work. Uh, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own findings. It wasn't like a very uh, sustained research, it's more like, you know, like empirical uh, findings. But, you know, I had to get three quotes from, from um, garden landscapers and all three of them 
recommended something called Indian sandstone uh, for pavement. And I, you know, like I have no idea what, like, you know, how they do it and where they get their materials. But like, I found it really interesting that they all recommended this Indian sandstone. So I started to Google it and just try to understand what sort of stone is it like, because initially I thought that Indian sandstone is just something about the aesthetics of the stone, but it's actually stone that is brought from India, right? And then I was like, really like surprised and a bit astonished. It's like, why do you need to bring stone from India to Britain? And it's a fashion. Apparently everybody does Indian sandstone nowadays. And um, so I, I asked one of these uh, landscapers and they told me, well, um, it's actually like one of the few natural sandstones that you can get nowadays. Um, and uh, yeah, we bring it from India. And actually there are big problems now because we had this massive COVID surge in India and all supply chains were disrupted and it was very difficult to get Indian sandstone. And then just like, it, it just like sort of clicked. I mean, like it's, you know, like you have all this like <laughs> new fashion in British gardens with Indian sandstone that is brought from India, probably on big containers, right? Like over the seas with massive sustainability issues. And especially that like nowadays we have technology to the technologies to make artificial stones that, that, that look nice and they can be used for pavement. And so there's clearly a question of, you know, like, you know, all this kind of tropes, like, you know, like colonialism, post post-colonialism power, like it's ingrained in this very seemingly simple thing. It's like, you know, people are renovating their gardens, you know, but there are like some massive issues that need to be discussed with this. Um, I think so. I really appreciate that you looked at the power issues and power relations in British gardens because I think that like they're so important and the question of sustainability is so 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 important. Um, and you know, um, I, I, I don't know if you have an opinion about this. Um, I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it kind of shows. I guess sort of how little you kind of know until you research it kind of like you said you realize that all three were suggesting this and then you looked into yourself and then there's this huge issue around it so um yeah again I think it kind of links to Harry's presentation because I didn't know anything about like all the sustainability issues with this kind of like mounting gear and things so I think it kind of shows I guess both how little we kind of know until it becomes either like a thing in the media or you research it yourself so um yeah, I think it's just interesting, I guess, that there are like these big issues with gardening and I guess people now renovating their own gardens. So um, mm. it just needs to, people need to be more aware, I guess, of these kind of issues. Um, there is a kind of different narrative with allotments to private gardens yeah. though, isn't there? Yeah. Because I have an allotment and allotments are very much a sort of make do kind of space. So you don't tend to buy new kind of materials to construct and think on or in your allotment you tend to sort of find and share so lots of people take things off skips for example or just reuse stuff that they find around an allotment itself so there is a completely sort of other narrative to those kind of more seemingly productive spaces I suppose as opposed to the leisure spaces of the of the kind of the garden itself Got a couple of hands up here. We've got Simon. Simon, do you want to chip in? Um, yes, I think Gareth was first, but uh, yeah, I th I think that yes, it is very very problematic. Um, that that what um, what Vlad brought up about uh, about buying your stone from India, um, and it's you know yes, it's very much driven by market, um, and um, and I I think. You know, immediately what you do is you just start a chain that um, that if you put stone in your garden, um, you get more runoff of rainwater, um, more rainwater goes into the gutter um, and you promote flooding um, and um, and the less less your garden absorbs water. Um, and we have a next door neighbor here who's been um, who's been graveling his entire garden. And um, and spraying it with with uh, weed killer, um, which is not a wonderful idea. It's kind of natural, um, sort of. Um, but um, but what he's doing is is immediately if you know if people are doing this right around the bloody country because it's fashionable, um, what you're doing is actually exacerbating the big hole which is being dug in the English Channel 
to supply the, the, the aggregate to create the gravel garden. Um, so that our, our, our relationship with nature is actually a very problematic one because it actually starts from being artificial. Um, and I, I, I think the, the difficulty is that through working with, um, working with say, um, uh, you know, growing your own veg and so on is actually a really good starting point. Um, because it starts with a conversation with the system. You know, that you are entering into a conversation with, um, with how things happen. And by golly, you know, anyone who does have a vegetable garden knows that, yeah, you've got black fly and, oh, God, and cabbage white butterflies gobbling everything up. And, you know, it's, 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 it's an absolute nightmare. Um, but you are, you are entering into a kind of conversation with how things happen, which actually is largely missing um, from our culture because we, we accept, and I think Harry has pointed this up, um, we accept that a lot of our experience is mediated um, by, by other systems, by human-made systems. Um, so our, our relationship with nature is hugely compromised. And um, getting back to that is actually I think very, very difficult because what initially happens is when you build a garden, um, there's, there's some kind of sense of gratification in there that you want something green and it's restful to the eye and so on. And I do think that the, 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 the images that Lucy showed um, of, the, <laughs> of the gardens, um, of the gardeners, in their gardens, and the and the lady with the concrete, and the and the and the gentleman looking ter terribly proud beside his tree. Um, that that what you've got is different levels of conversation. One is one is having power over, and the other is that you nurture how things something happens. And getting back to nurturing is is um, I think hugely different difficult because people because culture has disempowered us so much from being engaged in how natural systems work. Anyway, I'm going on too much. There wasn't a question there, um, but it was, it's um, really illuminating talks, both of them, I think. Um, and um, they do throw up problems. Um, and um, certainly with Harry, that, uh, that the issues to do with water and um, water and surprise, surprise in Nepal, there is big problems with drought um, seasonally because of the runoff, which happens only seasonally, and big fights over supply of water um, in, in communities. Anyway, I'm going to shut up there. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Gareth, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, Naomi. Um, I've got a question for Harry. Um, I uh, always think that the, a discussion around sustainable fashion is so huge and so enormous that it's very difficult to know how to go about doing it. Mm -hmm. So I was really impressed by how you had focused on one very, very particular and very niche sector of the fashion and garment industry, uh, uh, and which you can you can spin out your your argument and really uh, use that as a kind of very neat case study. So I particularly noticed that you, you'd kind of um, produced some tables of uh, different theorists and their different views, and you were then using that as a way of constructing a kind of way of judging North Face. My question to you is, could you do that? Have you developed a system to actually sustainably assess any kind of garment uh, or fashion firm? Could you, for example, use those same questions and those same theorists and those same issues to evaluate uh, H&M or, um, Fendi or whoever, you know, any, any other kind of sector. So it's really about um, the transferability of your methods to other parts of the fashion industry. Uh, yeah, to, to an extent, you definitely could. I think, um, I, I mean, the well, yeah, well, yeah, you definitely could because uh, I, I think it would definitely highlight a lot of issues. I mean, um, what, what you'll probably see is that most brands or, or people involved with fashion will focus just mainly on using less. So uh, 
when people think of sustainability, they think of adopting recycled material or um, or, or, or just try, just trying to limit their immediate impact on the environment um, through sort of replacing material and recycling or reusing. But um, I think the thing, the, the nice thing about the table that I, I had is that, because um, I, I think it's, uh, really hard to know what is what what people think is sustainable because it, you know you've got one one theorist who is saying oh we just need to have a circular economy which is the, the idea of a circular economy is keeping everything in a loop and then the other person is saying no we need a complete we, we need keep complete systematic change um well the other two theorists say that and i think um the the accepted idea of sustainability in fashion is just recycled material or this so then if you get you know if you apply my table to a brand like h&m um and you get to sort of like uh consumer awareness or less consumerist or you see what uh governance and sort of uh political or corporate responsibility they assume um it it highlights what what they're all not doing it, it highlights the issue because that it there is just probably that top section of the table is probably what most of them will fall into. Um, so yeah, to, to answer your question, it, yeah, you probably could apply it to most uh, fashion brands. Um, and it, it, yeah. So can I ask a, a, a follow on question from that then? Does this approach, um, is this useful uh, as to be an activist from outside fashion, trying to persuade the fashion industry and fashion consumers to change? Or should it be applied from within the fashion industry? I mean, where do you see yourself with that? Could you see yourself with a role to change fashion from within? Um, Why? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's hard because I, I yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it, the, the problem is, is that there's not really, well, yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I could, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> kind of like tangling up my answer, but. Um, well, it's a difficult question to answer. It is a difficult question. It's just like, um, I, I think really it's got to come from fashion because like, um, as, as Brooks, what one of the theorists I looked at highlights it, like, um, you know, ha having aware consumers is all well and good, but e even people that ethically consume don't are, aren't fully sustainable. So people will be like, oh, you know, I, I'm ethical. I bought a sustainable jumper or I buy fair trade or I buy um, I only shop secondhand for clothing, but then they'll go and do other things that aren't whole, like sustainable holistically. So um, I it's it's probably more it's got to come i it is weird but you know i it definitely systematic change really needs to happen and that it, it, it can come from the fashion industry but as a whole i think it needs to come it's a bit bit more than that really because the way that we operate as humans at the moment is you know we just can we just love consuming which a lot for a lot of the time we don't actually it you know it's it's a luxury to be able to consume um but it's probably a luxury that we can't afford if we're looking at sort of the global issue of climate warming and and sustainability does somebody else have a question sorry vlad's got his hand up and i think yeah <clears throat> but there is a question from claire um so Claire asked, um, Harry, do you think that North Face do enough as a brand to let consumers know about their sustainability efforts? No, um, uh, the, you know, they, they're all very, it's, it's a weird one because they're very like, um, obviously being, I, I think it was an interesting uh, way to look at sustainability by choosing mountaineer brands because the, the whole ethos of mountaineering and hiking companies is being out in the environment. So they're very sort of the core of their brand is, is that. And then, so while they, they kind of brand themselves on that and then they preach to an extent some things, but when you, when you look a bit deeper, they don't, they're not 
uh, I mean, like Patagonia would be a good company to look at um, in, in terms of sort of showing people their sustainability efforts. I mean, they, um, oh, I can't remember what they're called, eco labels. They, you know, their their consumer awareness is much better than the North Faces because they have little labels and um, in their clothing that tells you what you know whether it's um, been what what. Well, uh, um, I can't remember what it's called. It's like a it, an eco label. Do, do you remember Emma? It's the water sign eco label, and then uh, the other it, if it's fair trade or ethically. Yeah, they have lots of different kind of trust brands, like you've already mentioned, Harry. Like fair trade, like you can tell as well. all of these kind of globally agreed standards that brands can buy into. And they have to they have to achieve certain standards to be able to use those labels. So these are ways of the brands showing transparency about what exists behind their supply chains, and they are a way of showing educated consumers what uh, values that company has and exactly what they're kind of buying into when they buy those products. Yeah, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're I, I trust. yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, the North the North Face don't really do enough to educate. Um, yeah. To, to educate their consumers they 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 say we love the environment we do a bit of they well they don't really actually use that many recycled materials but they say oh we're trying to use a lot less we're trying to do this and that we're reducing the impact of our fabric mills but you're you know there's still a mass they're a big massive uh clothing i mean the, the north face is everywhere like it you know they have lifestyle clothing it's you know it's bigger than just mountaineering but um it just because they do a bit it's not enough and they're not uh educating people enough about the problems um um what put their hand up sorry Vlad again well I mean I, yeah but like uh, I asked my question already like earlier like uh, Rihanna also had her hand yeah, up so Rihanna. maybe like we asked like Rihanna do you want to ask a question yeah no I was actually really just it's it, it's what what Harry was saying now at the end um uh which was really you know seems to me like in this present there's kind of a paradox on the one hand sort of extreme lifestyles are becoming much yeah. more mainstream, right? You yeah. know, people going to Mars and everyone is running, you know, Iron Man, you know, whatever, marathons. And, you know, it's becoming, it's not just a kind of a very limited group of highly passionate, you know, the, you know, everyone can almost kind of do those sorts of activities. So that's kind of the popularization of these kind of extreme, extreme oh. activities is, is broadening. But on, the, on the other hand, and actually you really, my question was more about that in terms of whether there's a disconnect between the brand and how they communicate about sustainability it was precisely about, you know, is it because North Face is not really only for people who are passionate about nature, passionate about mount mountaineering, even though that's kind of their core origin, but actually, you know, with, you know, those sort of sportswear clothing are becoming, you know, everyday clothes for everyone, right? You're not, you know, you're not, you know, athleisure or whatever it's becoming s such a kind of a fundamental part of everyone's daily wardrobe so is there that you know does the disconnect kind of happen there because it's not just people who are passionate about nature and and those activities but it's everyone yeah who... uh, well I, that that is where where the issue is really i mean uh as a whole like the the, the mountaineering gear itself isn't necessarily it's, it's not very sustainable but it's not like the the big issue of the north face is its lifestyle so i mean because that that's what is sold in droves like that so much of that is what is uh being produced and, and worn everywhere so it's yeah i mean there's that also there's that dis disconnect of consumer because um the person the sort of person that buys mountaineering or hiking gear is probably more or right, they're, they're probably more interested in um the environment as a whole, as opposed to the the type of consumer that would buy the lifestyle clothing from the North Face, which is stocked in every high street store at the moment, um, they're they you know they they're buying it for the label. Um, that they're, they're not, but they they don't have any uh, thought behind that buy. They're not it. You know they're they're not caring about the environment when they're buying that product. 
Yeah. Although, cool. although brands like North Face sell really well on on Depop and other kind mm. of, so they they are reused in that sense. Yeah, no, they they definitely are, but they're they're also stocked in like size and stuff like that. Yeah. And it, you, you know, if if you if if you go to town, you'll see loads of people all. all, all all different demographics and types of people are all, you know, everyone wears North Face. I think that's, that is, that is yeah. Um, may, like, I'm, I'm aware that it's 11 o'clock, but like, yeah. may, may I still ask a, a question? Go ahead, Vlad. Now, I, I would go back to Lucy's presentation. Like, uh, there were some very interesting slides there about the Chinese Cultural Revolution. And that was, that, that that's something that I found very interesting. and. My question is to both presenters. Um, would you think? Would you consider? Would you think that um, a more sort of interventionist policies by states uh, would be recommended in this sort of situations? Because you know, like all these sustainability issues, global warming issues. I mean, they're becoming like massive, massive problems. And I think you know, <laughs> uh, they they require urgent action. And I, would you consider that an interventionist policy by states, you know, like, for example, like the British, Great Britain saying, okay, so, you know, you want to construct your gardens, okay, but then there is a certain quote of materials that you can source in a certain way, or, you know, would this be recommendable? Lucy, you still, yeah, you're over there. Yeah, um, I think it is kind of hard, because obviously not everyone has a garden, so... I think it is kind of hard to implement these things for all these different people that have different situations, but I guess it could be something that could be implemented like, um, I don't really know if this comparison is the best, but like I know for people that have like thatched housing and things, they have to get like the material for the thatching from certain places in the UK, like to be sustainable and things. So I guess it could be implemented in that way by saying like, if you want to use these materials in your garden, you have to source them from places in the UK and things. Um, uh, so yeah, I guess it could be something that could be implemented. It would just be sort of like how they would regulate it, I guess. Um, yeah, I think it would definitely help with like issues with sustainability and things if we had to sort of like source things from the UK. I think it would kind of <laughs> solve these issues, um, even if it wasn't reg regulated, if it was just kind of like encouraged, I guess. Um, I think it would definitely help some of these issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess it just would have to be if it is implemented by state, it has to be inclusive. So it has to be accessible for people at the bottom of society that have a lot less money whether that's through um it being subsidized or i don't know you know off offered for free to those kind of people if they're you know say if they're making their garden they need to get this and that uh, but they can only get it from locally sourced which is probably inevitably going to cost more because for some reason that's how it works at the moment but um but yeah okay Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to have to sort of close down the discussion, although there's so many more things that we could still discuss. I mean, we didn't. I mean, one of the things that Lucy picked up on in relation to Derek Jarman's garden was this notion of kind of queer safe spaces. And I think that that is a whole conversation in itself that I think we could discuss. Simon's just posted in the chat this notion of the kind of community garden movement, which again, I think is something um, that we could have um, much more discussion about. Um, I think, you know, obviously the sort of the big kind of takeaways are, are, are kind of, you know, they're, they're very much out there. This notion of our need to address our practices of consumption um, and our, our need to sort of rethink our relationship to nature and this kind of notion that you know we are not separate from nature but that we're we're part of the same you know we're entangled with it we are we are nature as well we're not something other to it um, I think that's probably something that will be picked up maybe in one of the, the later panels but I just want to thank our two uh, contributors today thank you very much to Lucy and thank you very much to Harry both been fantastic and you know I hope that you will support your fellow students throughout the rest of the day and attend the the other panels that are coming up um the next panel Vlad is at uh, the next panel is at uh 11 30 and it's a panel on sustainability 
<laughs> so it's kind of related. We continue those discussions there, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, please join us, 11.30. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And thank you very much for coming. Okay. And to both presenters. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, well done. Yeah, that was thank great. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Harry, read read Mountains of the Mind. It's it's a it's a fascinating history. Robert McFarland, I don't know if any of the rest of you have read it. Um, it's it was his PhD dissertation that he turned into a book, and it's a basically a kind of historical contextualization of humans' relationship to mountains. And you know, from thinking of mountains as scars on the landscape, you know, they called them pimples because it was this horrible, dangerous thing that would impass, impede their 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 traveling to being this thing that we can conquer and now being, you know, a, a sort of sense of, of achievement. This very, very different relationship between human beings and mountains. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have a look at it. Thank you for the suggestion. And, and, and obviously, like, you know, like on Netflix, there is this film from uh, 2015, I think it's called uh, Sherpa. Oh, yeah. Probably you've seen uh, it. I watched that in my research. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now.